So, uh, hello everyone, thanks for joining. Um, I'm over in London, just to see. Um, and Andre set this slide to keep going. Andre, you need to set these slides so Sorry they don't about move. That. Here we go. All right, um, we're recording. Um, so I'm going to be muting everyone. Uh, as you see, today we've got um, Ezhan Iran Nijad, uh, which is really exciting. We're really um, looking forward to uh, what uh, Ezhan is going to go through. Um, if you don't know, Ezhan is uh, he's, well, he's going to introduce a little bit himself. Um, he's worked in our, it started working in the architecture field, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Ezhan, and then um, kind of migrated through into the technology field. And now is doing some absolutely fantastic work with McNeil, with the Rhino inside. Uh, and of course, it's what we're going to be talking about tonight mainly is like the integration of Python in Revit, which opens up some really fantastic customization opportunities. And it's just really fascinating, really, how about the, the world of the Revit API and how Python interacts with it. It's going to be a really exciting talk. Uh, Esan has a really fascinating background, um, which I'm sure is going to come through in what he's going to go through tonight with PyRevit, um, the Revit add-in that he's authored. Um, He's spoken about PyRevit quite a lot, I believe. Uh, so some of you might already have heard, um, but uh, I'm really excited to hear about the updates and just what's going on with PyRevit and um, the world of Python and Revit. So uh, Esan, thanks a lot for joining us. Um, before Absolutely. I pass you over, um, I'm just gonna go through some of the Revit user group stuff though. Um, so thanks to the sponsors for tonight. Um, uh, just going through the slides. Um, tonight's talk, Andre, actually, you may need to remind me who tonight's talk is sponsored by. But this is these are the ongoing sp uh, sponsors who are involved with the um, operations of the group. We're really grateful for their input. The webcast is provided by Populous, which is vicariously me at Populous. Uh, we're working on the, the Zoom, using the Zoom capabilities. And the group itself, I think some of you are all familiar with quite a few of us. Um, you've just heard Andre in the beginning of the talk and we're joined by a few of us here tonight, including myself. Uh, coming up, um, we'd just like to talk about some of the other events. We try and avoid overlapping with some of the key, certainly the New York key events, uh, like the Thornton Tomasetti Symposium. Uh, really exciting. That's uh, on the horizon. We actually arranged with Esan for tonight to avoid it because we didn't want to <clears throat> be trying to uh, uh, speaking around what's going on. Some really exciting series of talks lined up. Really, really amazing stuff. So we're looking forward to that. Um, so yeah, in, in the in the other forthcoming months, you can see we've got um, November energy modeling uh, and render engines comparison. Uh, I can't expand on that. I think Andre may uh, expand on that better than myself. Um, and December downstream BIM collaboration and big hybrid projects. Um, we're always open to kind of hearing if you want uh, to hear a certain talk or if you want to give a talk, we're always open to hearing from you. So please reach out to any of us for either if you want to speak or hear certain topics from any discipline, architecture, structure, engineering, um, owner, etc. Mm -mm. So we won't be having AIA credits tonight. Um, it makes it a little bit easier to talk in the context of software. Um, 
the AIA, it can be quite challenging talking about software specifics and gaining AIA credits. So um, just a note on that one for tonight. Um, and on that one, I think that's all. That's everything. So over to you, Esteban. Thank you so much for joining us. We're all really excited to hear from you and um, seeing what you're up to and hearing um, more about PyRevit. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, guys, for the opportunity um, for me to talk a little bit about PyRevit and about Python, well, using Python in the Revit environment in general. Um, we, I have about like 45 minutes of talking about this and most of this time we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna show you what Pirate really is um, and sort of like uh, uh, provide some sort of a comparison between Python development and C-sharp development in, in Revit and using the Revit API. And uh, I'm gonna show you some of the tools of, uh, that Pirate has and sort of like, you know, I'll show you how Pirate could be helpful in your workflows. Um, I'm gonna start sharing at this point. Let's see if I can get this. Right. Okay. One second. Let's, let's use this. Okay. Great. Um. So I started Pine Revit about in twenty end of twenty fourteen, about six years ago. Well, more than six years ago, when I started getting deeper into using Revit on it on in, in production mode, basically on large scale projects. Um, and I realized that Py, uh, Revit doesn't have a really good automation interface at that point. You could, um, so the, Rev, uh, the version of Revit that I started was um, 2013, uh, which I was working on um, more deep, uh, sort of like uh, in, on, the, on the bigger projects. But what I realized is that the, um, hold on one second if I can see me. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, what I realized quickly is that the, um, I needed I needed some sort of a framework to be able to automate the the tasks that I wanted to perform on on Revit. And one of the biggest challenges was that uh, using C sharp as an architect was quite hard because the C sharp development is quite time consuming. You have to write your own program, compile it, launch Revit, debug it, uh, find the errors, go back, and start the process again. So it's quite time time consuming. I needed something that would help me. Uh, that I could use as a as a sidekick, as a as a uh, Swiss knife, while I was working as an architect, to be able to have something on my on the side, like the command line that he had in AutoCAD or in like more, uh, or in similar softwares that you can just use to uh, sort of like batch process um, stuff and run scripts and whatnot. Something like this I really needed in Revit. Um, so I found this project that's called RPS, Revit Python Shell, and I used the concepts of that to be able to create a um, a a simple program that runs on Revit, that reads and finds the Python files that I've created on my hard drive and sort of like create a user interface for that inside Revit so I can easily access that, um, access those single scripts as buttons, as functions. And that's what essentially what Pyravid is today. What, um, how the Pyravid evolved over time to be a rapid, rapid prototyping environment for Revit. Um, so it actually, alongside uh, Python and C, Iron Python and C Python, it can actually run C Sharp, VB.net, and uh, access Dynamo and Grasshopper uh, if you have those add-ons installed on, on your Revit. And quite a um, sort of like a collection of different tools that you can actually use um, in PyRevit. Um, the, I just want to double check to see if, uh, you guys can see my screen, right? Yeah, so I don't get that. Yeah, we can you see can it. You can see the PyRevit window because I don't get that uh, green bounding box around it. Yeah. We, we see okay. the screen that has the Pyravit logo on, up top. Okay, and then, awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, so yeah. the, the Pyravit project has started as a, um, um, as what I basically explained, explained that, and it sort of like evolved over time to be, to be this collection of scripts. And uh, that was quite useful for the, you know, day-to-day -day process of what I was working on and um, uh, evolved to be a, a really good framework for rapid prototyping application in Revit. So these days, if you find, if you open your browser and uh, sort of like search for PyRevit, um, you'll get, you'll find this link to the GitHub repo. Um, this is this is the one that sort of like ends in Iran's on PyRevit. That's the main repository for this project. It's open source um, and it's free and it will be uh, open source as free forever. 
um, you can uh, sort of like if you are familiar with Python programming and whatnot, you can clone this project, you can configure it and customize it for your own companies, however you want to do, however you want to work with, um, that's, uh, it's completely open. Um, there's a link to the, uh, what I call the PyRabbit wiki on the side. Um, if you open that, you get this uh, sort of like Notion web page, Notion workspace that's shared as a website um, to the outside. So this is what you see in your browser. This is what I call the PyRabbit wiki. Uh, between this wiki and the repo for the project, you pretty much have everything you need to know about what PyRabbit is. Um, there are a couple of things that are associated with it, like the Twitter account and the YouTube for videos and whatnot, that are all linked inside the wiki so you can easily access those. Um, those are like extra content, but for, for developing with PyRabbit and using the tools, the wiki is pretty much uh, everything you need. Uh, the wiki is categorized in the, into a couple of different, different pieces. The first one is to get you started, get started using PyRabbit and getting started developing for PyRabbit. So two different getting started sections, depending on what you're trying to do with PyRabbit. PyRabbit, as I mentioned, has these two um, sort of like main aspects, one in being a, a development framework and the other one being a good set of tools that uh, showcase the powers of those, uh, that framework and also gives you a lot of uh, good tools to, to work with. Um, staying updated, dealing with issues, getting involved with the project if you want to get involved, and a sort of like uh, a couple other pages. Um, there are a couple of like very simple pages here on how to install Pyramid, get installed your machine. A couple of like standard tools and the, basically the most popular tools on Pyramid have actual documentations in here. Um, there are a couple of YouTube videos associated with those uh, tools that I'll show you how to get the, get to them. And uh, if you're developing for your Pyramid, these this developer doc is basically going to be the, the, the main, um, the end point that you need to know everything that you need for development. There are articles to get you started with uh, Python development, .NET development, the private hooks, what I call it, and all that kind of stuff. A lot of the stuff I, I can actually, I, I won't get into like showing the inner workings of them, but I'm going to mention them towards the end of the talk so you know what kind of functionalities and features are available as part of, uh, as part of the PyRabbit. There's a link to all the videos that's on the YouTube channel and a whole lot of like references, much more you know, detailed references on how things uh, work in Pyramid and what facilities and uh, sort of like features are available to you. Um, when you install Pyramid and launch your Revit after the installation, uh, this is what you get. You get this window that I call it the Pyramid output I'm window. <laughs> you get this window that's that's called the Pyramid output window. Um, the on the first run, Pyramid will tell you uh, a couple of, it gives you a couple of information about like the, the environment that's running on the version of Revit, the extensions that it's finding and everything else. And sort of like gives you a, a nice report of what's happening in, during the launch process. Um, the top, the ribbon part of this window is, is fixed across all the Pyramid tools that output anything uh, for the user. Uh, just so you know, there's the version of PyRevit and the version of Revit that's being used is on top of the window. So when you're reporting bugs and stuff, when you send a screenshot of this window to me, I can actually see which version of PyRevit and which version of Revit you're working with. So whenever you're taking the screenshots, it would be very nice if you can include that, um, that top bar in, the, um, in, the, uh, in your screenshots. And then there's a couple of other tools to like copy the contents and save it and you know, see it in a browser and all that kind of stuff. It's actually a pretty uh, powerful output window. Um, if you don't want to see this on the on the um, startup of Revit, um, you can change that in the private settings that I'll show you in a, in a couple of seconds. Um, so this is the standard Revit window. I'm going to maximize this. Hopefully you'll see whatever that's happening on top of the screen. Um, but when the Pyrevit is loaded, note that there would be an extra tab here that's called PyRevit. And this is the base set of tools that ship with PyRevit that is a sort of like for me, it was my the, the sidekick that I told you that I talked to about um, all these tools that I use to do my daily job. A lot of them are fa fairly simple tools. They're not really that complicated, but they get a the job done and they, um, they you know, reduce a lot of headache and uh, save a lot of time. Um, the, the underlying framework, you don't generally interact with it. Uh, the only thing that you generally interact with is the tools. Unless you want to get into the development, then there is, uh, then I'll show you how you can create quickly extensions for Pyrate and stuff like that and sort of like add your own tools. Um, the, the first panel in this tab is called PyRevit and it's a slide out. So if, when you open it, you see the about button for PyRevit, the update, the extensions, 
uh, that I'll explain a little bit, a couple of links to the websites and stuff. And the settings is one of the most important things that you want to know about PyRevit if you want to configure it the way um, you want it to be. There's not a whole lot of configuration. Most of the tools make an assumption based on uh, the sort of like the context and the project that you're working on and all that kind of stuff. But there's a couple of things that you might change in the settings. I want to quickly uh, give you an overview of the settings window because it might feel a little bit daunting at first. Uh, the for the first part, so all these settings are grouped into different uh, different categories. Uh, the first part is called the core settings. Generally, you don't really need to deal with that kind of stuff. Uh, PyRevit uses different Python engines. If you end up having issues with uh, uh, conflicts with Dynamo or wanted to use a different version of uh, Iron Python for development, this is where your engine settings are. Um, and that's pretty much it for the rest of the stuff. Everything else that's in there, you'll know when you start uh, actually developing for PyRevit. So as a standard user, you don't really need to deal with any of that stuff. Um, the reporting levels is another one of them. You can see that the first window that I showed you when PyRevit loads, you can actually disable that reporting from here if you don't wanna see that report when you launch your rep. Um, I generally keep mine active. You can actually assign it um, a, a timeout to it too. So it closes by itself automatically if you just wanna see it, but don't wanna have it hanging around. Um, the routes and the telemetry APIs, I'll talk a, a, little about, a little bit about towards the end of the video. I just wanted to show you what these are. Um, and then the supported Revit versions is one of the things that you can use to uh, attach, what I call it, attach or detach PyRevit from the different versions of Revit that um, are on your system. Uh, the PyRevit installation, there's only one of them. You don't get multiple different PyRevits for every different uh, every Revit version. There's only one PyRevit installation on your system. PyRevit dynamically compiles itself against whatever uh, version of Revit that you're running on, and it caches all that stuff. Um, the only thing that you need to tell PyRevit is that which versions of Revit do you want PyRevit to be attached to? Being attached means that when you uh, launch that Revit version, PyRevit loads with it as an add-on. If it's not attached, it won't load. Um, there are a couple of user interface settings. Um, the language, there's some of these settings that are in there, but it's under active development, like the language. There's a whole list of languages that Revit supports that I've added in here too, but not all the tools or messages in PyRevit have been translated. That's sort of like a community effort that's uh, ongoing. Um, there is a colorize open documents. As you might notice, I'm gonna actually use my Windows magnifier here. Uh, you might notice on top of these two tabs, there's a colored bar. Um, you can use this part of it feature to um, enable and disable these colored bars on top of the tabs. So it color codes your projects, your project tabs based on the project that's working on, that you're working on. If there's a border around that tab, that means that document is a family document, not a project document. Um, the output window is a, a basically an HTML output window. So you could uh, use a completely different style sheet to install it the way you want it to be for your own company and projects and whatnot. Uh, but this is some sort of like a little bit more um, advanced parts of the PyRevit. And then the last part that's always open is the place that you add, you basically tell PyRevit where else on your drives it can find extensions. PyRevit has this model that all the tools and all the um, sort of like functionality that's shipped as part of the PyRevit is designed as extensions. Even PyRevit's own tools are an extension that's uh, basically being shipped with PyRevit by default. Um, you can, these extensions have been designed to be uh, very easy to create and work with. And I'll show you towards the end of the video how you can create your own extension and sort of like add a series of buttons and functions to Revit. Um, so that's uh, sort of like the overview of what PyRevit is. Uh, every time you launch PyRevit, PyRevit goes into these, finds these ex extensions, find the scripts, uh, based on the configurations and assumptions that it has, it creates a series of buttons and a user interface for you. Every time you click on that button, it runs that script for you um, freshly. So um, the every time you, make, you can basically open your script on the site, make changes to it, click on the button again, and it would run the uh, run the script for you again. This was incredibly important to me as an architect because I have large projects that take half an hour to open and I can't afford uh, closing and opening revenue every time I wanna make changes, uh, change to a script. So that's one of the advantages of using a, um, a framework like PyRevit that sort of like can stay uh, active as you're working. Even if you add buttons and remove buttons and make more drastic changes to PyRevit, there's a reload button that refreshes the PyRevit session within PyRevit basically within your Revit session without the need to close and open um, Revit at all. Um, so I want to go. You, uh, I want to go and uh, sort of like show a couple of the tools that are available to, uh, available to you in PyRevit to give you an idea of like what kind of functionalities you can add um, to Revit, and you might find a lot of these tools actually helpful for day-to-day -day use. 
Uh, the top coloring that I mentioned, there's a toggle button for here that you can turn it off and on. So um, the first time you click on the part of your tools, they run slightly slower just because it needs to run, uh, load the engines and prefer. But you can use this button to enable and disable these, um, these top coloring uh, bars. Uh, if you have a lot of add-ons in Revit, uh, there's a tool that's called Minify Revit UI. It removes a lot of the extra um, um, sort of like tabs and bars and stuff like that in your Revit, especially if you're using different languages like German has, um, Revit has very long name for the tabs in German and it sort of like quickly goes out, outside of the window. Um, well, if you have noticed, some of these tools in Pyrovit have a black dot in front of them. This means that the Pyrovit button has configurations. Pyrovit, uh, for its user interface, has this concept that you can have, you can hold modifier keys being Control Alt Shift uh, and the Windows uh, key on your keyboard to change the behavior of what the uh, what the tool does. So with a black dot, it means that uh, the tool has configuration. And if you look at the tooltip, the tooltip actually tells you that if you shift click, you get the configuration for that tool. So if I hold shift and click on this tool, I get the configurations for that tool. And this in this configuration, I've selected the tabs that I don't want to see. And I say, hi, selected tabs in the minified mode. And every time I click on that toggle, it'll hide those tabs for me and disable it, they come back. Um, this, this sort of like these buttons that I'm showing to you is the is in all grouped in the panel toggles and they all pretty much act as toggles. Uh, I'm going to open one of these. Uh, let's close a whole bunch of these to make it a little bit simpler to follow. I'm going to open the first level and I'm going to add a view here, which is going to be a reflective ceiling plan for the same level. Um, if you go back and forth between different views in a project, you'll know that it kind of it's it's really annoying that they uh, you can't really follow the pan and zoom of the view. So you constantly have to find the same room in multiple different views that you're working with. By the way, you notice that all these tabs they have the same color on the on their on their bar, so they you know that visually you know they're part of the same project. Um, so I'm going to under PyRevit and hit on sync views, and as you see when I switch to level one change my pan and come back to the RCP, the, it keeps the pan and zoom level of that view synchronized between the different views. So it's, it makes it very easy for me to visually switch between tabs and figure out if things are on top of each other, organize them one on. You can use the underlays and overlays in Revit as well for this too, but just this is a lot quicker to turn off and on and um, uh, sort of like work with multiple different views. Um, there are a couple of different selectors that part of it has to make selection um, in Revit a lot simpler than uh, sort of like the built-in features. Right now, if I wanna say, select all the grids in this project, um, I kind of have to do a bounding box, select a, a lot more elements, and then go into the filter on the corner of the screen and filter out the grids that I wanted to, wanted to pick. One of the easiest way to do this is to use the PyRevit pick tool. So I can click on pick and I can say I want grids. And as you can see, some of these PyRevit tools give you a series of options this way. Um, the options are simple sort of like to choose from. That's why they have a uh, smaller, tinier user, uh, user interface. There are not extra options associated with it. So you can easily search for what you want and then say grids. And when you do a box selection, it only picks the grids for you. There's no filtering required after that, um, which has two benefits. First of all, you don't have the extra step of filtering. And uh, the first one being when you have a very uh, a lot of view with a very large number of elements in it, when you do a box selection, uh, Revit gets slower, the view gets slower because he has to draw all this like extra work sharing um, um, uh, gizmos and all that kind of stuff on the elements. So it, it just, it's, it, it, it's not a lot of fun selecting all those elements just because you want a whole bunch of um, a, a subset of that selection. Um, the tool, again, you see there's a black button in front of it. If you shift click, you can customize the list of uh, categories that you see as part of the default categories in the tools whenever you click on them. So if you're a structural engineer, you can configure it to show you whatever you want to see. Um, there is a subset of this tool for the detail elements only and model elements only. So this only picks the detail elements in the view. It doesn't touch the model elements. This is especially helpful if you have like a section or a plan view that's moved and you want to kind of move all the 2D elements and assign it and sort of like realign it with the content. Uh, use cases like this, it makes it very, uh, very, very helpful. Um, there is a uh, set work set. This model that I'm using right now, it's not work set, but set work set tool. Uh, you can actually select any tool, any uh, element in Revit 
and uh, click on the set work set and it would switches your active work set to the work set of that element. Um, so sort of like a very similar uh, command that we had in Autodesk uh, that it could swap the la default layer to the layer of the selected element. Same thing it does with the work sets. Um, there's a couple of other tools in here too, especially like isolate different, uh, different uh, uh, sort of like elements in Revit. Like if I say isolate doors, it isolates the doors for me and it puts your view into a temporary um, uh, view graphic. So you can sort of like isolate stuff like that. Um, and then uh, let's say, isolate room tags, it'll isolate the rooms, room tags, but it also um, uh, knows that it has to keep the rooms in the view also, otherwise the room tags wouldn't be, wouldn't be visible. So it's kind of like smart in the way um, it picks what elements need to be isolated properly to get, a, to get that isolated view that you were really looking for. Normally, if you isolate view tags, you, don't, you won't see anything because the rooms are, have been removed from the view. Um, there is this other feature in Pyrobit for selection that's that's super powerful. Um, if you remember the uh, the sort of like the old school calculators, there was a memory. There are a couple of memory functions on them: m plus, m minus, m clear, that kind of stuff. Um, the same functionality, the same concept works in 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 Pyrobit. For example, if I want to say I want to uh, select the walls on this level and the level on top, I can go say in uh, pick. I want to pick walls, and I'm going to pick all these walls in here, and I'm going to uh, Pyrobit, and I'm going to say memory write. So, so write these elements that I just selected into a memory. Then I can deselect. I can go to level two here, do another pick with walls. Excuse me, do another, do another pick with walls. And in this time, instead of um, writing it to memory, I'm going to say append it to memory, memory append. Uh, and it would add these two um, to each other. So if I go to the 3D view and I'm gonna put this into a hidden view, I can see this stuff easier. Now I can say memory read and it would select the walls for the first floor and the second floor. Basically every uh, selected selection that you had in the memory, it read those as, as, as one selection. Um, I have moved a full portions of like wings of a building this way because I can easily go throughout the floors, select the different model elements, select the uh, different detail element, um, check my selection, go into 3D, make sure all this stuff that I want is selected. And once I'm comfortable with the selection that I have across all the views, then I can move a whole wing of a building maybe a couple of feet away and I won't get that many uh, or at all or that many errors from, uh, from Revit because just you're moving everything properly together. Uh, so that's this is super helpful, and you can save this memory. You can sort of like traverse through the uh, elements in the selection and stuff like that. You can save it as a selection. You can purge the memory files. There's a whole bunch of stuff that are associated with it. Um, another one of the tools in PyRevit, if I go, let's say, in this view and save walls, I want it to have on the cut pattern. I want to have a solid. Let's go from here. Solid with a different color. Um, so sort of like, you know, show all the uh, um, solid walls like this, because I cut the cut walls like this. Um, if you want to copy the visibility graphics or other view features, you can use the copy and paste state tools. So I can say copy state, uh, copy the visibility graphics of the view that I'm on. I'm going to go to another view, say paste state, and it would automatically paste whatever that you have copied from another view to it. So it's a very quick way to, if you have working views, uh, I use working views a lot to sort of like visualize the Revit data in, in different ways for me. Uh, they're not documentation views, they're just control views. They're, you know, people have different different um, uh, names for these kind of views, but this is sort of like super helpful to uh, keep the uh, temp, uh, uh, the temporary graphic uh, that you apply to these uh, to these views without really creating too many view templates in your in your model and making it too complicated for everybody else. So these are super, super helpful. You can find the crop regions, uh, the filter overrides, the view zoom pan and uh, zoom pan and state. And if you have a 3D view, you can get the 3D uh, section box of the view and you can actually synchronize that with other 3D views as well. You can copy the state of a uh, section box and go to another 3D view and paste it there. Um, there are a couple of tools under analysis, like find the range of loops, roof slopes that you have in a model. Uh, I use this a lot, get parking count in current view. So if I have a site view with parking elements, get a quick count of those um, in my view, just to make sure I have the right number of parkings. Um, uh, there are a couple of inspects if you want to like inspect uh, uh, the situation around uh, Revit models, like find identical room numbers, or um, yeah, sometimes you want to find uh, all the other elements that are attached to 
uh, to LLM in Revit. So let's say you have a piece of equipment that has tags on different views and you don't know if you delete this piece of equipment, how many other views will get actually affected or lose their tags. That's one of the good ways, uh, good uh, sort of like instances to use the uh, find referenced element tool. Uh, this, you can select the, uh, select the Revit element, use this tool on it. It would fake delete that element, tries to find everything else that changes the Revit model and give you a report of like all those, all those changes. So it's a quite useful tool. Um, I'll let you uh, sort of like inspect and figure out how you wanna, uh, which one of these tools are actually uh, important to you. Now, almost all of the tools have really good, uh, really good tool tips on them. The tool tip describes what exactly the tool is. Some of them uh, like this actually have videos associated with the, uh, with the tool as well. So if you hover over the tool, you almost get almost everything that you need to know about that tool and how it operates. Um, there's a good set of match tools. You can match uh, the configurations between the different dimensions. So if I go, into this, let's say view. And if I add a dimension in here, and if I add another one here, and if I go here and I don't know, add something, um, I don't know, something like that below that, below that uh, text, I can actually go and say, hey, match this to this. And it would match those configurations. And again, um, there's a black dot in front of it. So if you click, you can actually select what you wanna match for the dimensions and for the ele element graphic overrides. So it matches the element graphic overrides and dimension overrides between multiple different uh, dimensions or elements. So you can match paints, the actual paints that you have applied to the objects. So that's super helpful. You can see in the video, you can pick up the paint from somewhere and apply it to other faces. Uh, this is super helpful, especially if you're sort of like doing um, manual overrides on the, on the materials. You can always make sure that you pick what's shown and then apply it to the, uh, to the other faces for more consistency. There's a match properties tool that you can um, select two different elements and match the properties between them. I'll, I'll show you how this works if I, if I have uh, enough time towards the end. And then um, the, that's pretty much like about the match tools are pretty, pretty uh, helpful utilities. Uh, there's a make pattern tool that's been super famous. Um, I don't know if I've played with it or not. I'm going to create a detail view here. Let's go, uh, let's go here. And um, I'm going to draw a box, which is, oh, actually, this is outside of the bounds of that view. Um, draw a box here. And this box is, represents the to tile that's going to be uh, repeated as a pattern. Uh, then I'm going to draw a piece of line in the middle of it. And if you notice, I'm actually using in spline uh, instead of a normal solid line. So uh, this tool can actually um, it understands curves so you can break this apart and uh, build a pattern for you as required. So you can use all the line work in, that's available to you in Revit to create patterns. Um, I'm gonna select the content of my tile, not the boundaries. The boundaries is not, uh, is not required. I'm gonna say make pattern, model pattern, give it a name, uh, custom pattern. And then a couple of configurations for the pattern. You can flip it, you can rotate it, you can scale it, uh, all that kind of stuff. And then you can create the pattern, pick the two corners, and it would generate the pattern for you. Now I can go here and create a field region. Uh, the tool actually has an option to create this field region automatically for you if you want to. Uh, but in this case, I'm just going to use the, this is a good time to use the new search feature. So it would generate a pattern for you based on that line. And you can actually export this pattern later if you want to. You can go to the tool without selecting anything. You can go and find your um, custom pattern. And then you can export the pad file here if you wanna use it in CAD. Uh, one of the other things that you can do is that you can actually use a field region as a selection for this tool. So if you already have a pattern, you can draw an instance of it, use that and here you can scale it, you can rotate it, you can combine different patterns, you can um, sort of like you know, draw two field regions and select those. And this way you can combine the definitions, the line uh, definitions for these two patterns using this tool. Um, all of this is described in the videos that are associated with the tool and the documentation that's on the wiki. Um, so I call it sort of like the hidden features of this, uh, the make pattern tool. Um, there's another utility that's super valuable. Let's say I have two views here selected that are named level one and level two. There's this tool that's called revalue. If you click on it, um, the, the elements that I have are view elements. 
I'm reading the name parameter of those. And I want to change the name of these using a pattern. I'm going to tell this tool that, hey, there is this level part that is basically the text level, or actually let's just type level. And there is number right after that. Uh, so you're basically telling the tool what the pattern of this uh, existing name is. And here you can say maybe number F level or floor, or I don't know, something else. Um, other name or something. Um, so you basically disrupt the existing pattern and a new pattern, and you have extractors to extract the pieces that you want from the existing pattern and apply it to the new pattern. So very quickly, I can rename everything that says level one and level two to first F, uh, second F kind of thing with a, with a different name very quickly. And then say apply new values and it would rename those elements for you. This is not only for views, you can actually rename uh, so whole sorts of uh, different elements and different parameters on them. You can, that's why it's called revalue. It's not just for the names. You can change the values of different properties this way as well. Anything that's sort of like a string variable, um, you can change that. Um, there are a couple of tools to work with 3D uh, views. Uh, one of them that is uh, sort of like very popular and powerful is, uh, let's say, oh, I have section box hidden in this view. Um, let's say I want to work with that angled piece of that building and I want this section box to be aligned with that. One of the things that it can do is that you can say or, orient section box to face and it can pick a face and it would rotate the section box to be aligned with that. So now I can focus on that wing of the building and easily get into a, a section of it that I want to work with. This is like, it's a, it's a super powerful tool, especially if you're used to working in 3D views for, for drawing and for modeling. There's a whole lot of tools associated with sheets, moving views between different sheets, copying them, uh, playing with the uh, sort of like uh, the uh, different configurations for the sheets, title blocks, all that kind of stuff. One of the tools that's really popular and really powerful is this batch sheet maker. I'm going to start a new, actually give me one second, let me open it, empty model. That doesn't have any other sheets in it. So the sheets are empty. I'm going to use this tool to generate a whole bunch of sheets for me. So I'm going to say A100, double columns, A110, tab, sheet name. And I'm going to say, I'm going to want to create sheets using this title block, and it would generate a series of sheets for me. This is a great way of um, sort of like uh, creating lists of uh, the sheets that for, are available for your structural or mechanical or any, everybody else. You can ask your sub consultants to give you a list of these sheets or range of these sheets that sort of like is defined the way um, part of it can work with them this way with double colons or double dashes and stuff like that. And you can just paste that in here and create sheets with the title block that you want or create place orders if you, if you need to. That's a very good way of uh, sort of like creating a lot of sheets if you need to. Um, there's a whole range of tools to work with revisions. You can create revised uh, sheet sets. You can set and turn off revisions on the sheets very quickly. This is all batch process. So you can select a lot of different um, sheets that way. So in this case, I'm going to create a whole bunch of revisions in this model. And I'm gonna say revision, set revision on sheets, two and four on these sheets, let's say, and set the revision on them. And it would go around and set these revisions on all those sheets and it would give you a basic report of what's available. Now I can go here and say revisions, create a revised sheet set for revision two, I think it was the one that I used, create sheet set, and it would generate a sheet set for me and it would tell me what sheets are available in that revision. What it does is that if I go to control P right now to print, I can see there is a sheet set saved here with revision two that has all those sheets saved in it. So it's a very quick way of just printing a, a set of drawings that you want for a specific revision or a combination of revisions. Um, and a whole bunch of other tools that are like super, super helpful for working with, uh, working with um, revisions. Um, there is another, I don't know, I have about like 10 minutes left. Um, there is another tool that I wanted to show you that's very popular, been super helpful. It's been buggy for a while, but I've been working hard on getting those uh, bugs out of the tool. So it's, it's fairly uh, working fairly, it's fairly stable right now. And it's called the print sheets tool. I'm going to switch to this model that I have for um, another company, sort of like our template model. I'm going to go to PyRevit and use this print sheets tool. Um, under my schedules, there is a uh, sort of like, let's go under, let's say 100. There is a 
uh, schedule that is for architectural drawing index. Uh, the purpose of the print tool in PyRevit is to help you print sheets in the way, in the order and the format that you want for your own projects. Um, it doesn't enforce any configurations on you in the way of like uh, how sheets need to be um, sorted. So you can come up with all sorts of uh, properties and whatever methods that you use to get your sheets sorted in a Revit model. As long as this schedule is sorted, what it reads is that uh, you can just head on the print sheets and you can tell, you can select the project that you're working on. It sees all the linked projects or active projects that are uh, active in your Revit session. So you can print sheets off of a linked project as well uh, without really opening that linked model. And then you can pick the index, the drawing index for those uh, indexes, indices. And it sort of like lists all those sheets in order for you here. And it would print that. You can add a, um, a sort of like a number in front of this um, um, to sort of like, you know, add a, a range of numbers in front of this. So you can, um, uh, when the file actually printed, all of them start with two or whatever number of digit number. So they're all sorted in the Windows Explorer as well. So if you wanna combine these PDFs together later with a whole bunch of other drawings that you get from structure and mechanic or whatnot, um, they're all sorted correctly in your, in your folders. Uh, you can combine all of these sheets into one PDF, keeping the order. Uh, it kind of uses a hacky way to do it, but it works 99% of the time, which is super helpful. Um, the, uh, there's a naming format. So at the end of this, you can see there's a file name that it shows you the PDF file name of that file. You can pick different naming formats for this, for the PDF file names, and you can define and design your own naming formats in here as well. So especially if you're working with online um, uh, submission platforms for cities and whatnot, and they have special, special requirements for the way the names, uh, the file needs to be named. You can actually create your own naming formats for different municipalities and whatnot. And it can grab information from sheet parameters, title block parameters, project parameters, global parameters, whatever you need to put inside the name of that sheet, um, um, sort of like to, to generate that sheet name for you. Um, the printer, you can select the printer that you want and the series of sheets that you, the sheet uh, settings that you have into, inside your Revit model that you want to print with. One of the other things that it lets you do is that you can use a variable paper size um, or paper configuration basically for your, for your print. So um, in this case, I have, and it's sort of like it's smart enough to read the title block size and figure out what is the, what is the appropriate print settings for that, uh, for that sheet. But let's say, I don't know, you have a sheet in here that you want to print with, oh, this is a different branch of, oh, sorry, I'm on the development branch of PyRevit. Um, so you can uh, hit set print settings and switch to a different, um, a different uh, uh, what is it, the uh, page settings basically. So I can set a color page settings for this specific sheet or a different sheet size for that. And it would use a different configuration to, the, to print that sheet for you. So it's sort of like a very, very powerful print tool. It's based on this project from Ryan McCullough, but um, it's sort of like a lot more uh, advanced over time and whatnot. And it has this guide as well that tells you how you can apply these um, these changes and stuff like that. And you would um, remember those on the configurations on the title blocks for the next use and, and whatnot. Uh, so it's a fairly powerful powerful tool. Sorry for that error. This is my development branch of Pirate. I was working on this before the presentation. Um, there are a couple of uh, simple tools to work with your project. Um, so get the central pass, for example, fairly simple tool. This model is not um, centralized, but it gives you the full path of the central model. A lot of times when you go into that sync window, sync the full path is really hard in Revit. This gives you a very good way of to confirm that you're syncing to the, uh, you're using the right central model. Um, if you want, if you have a series of other Revit models and you want to figure out what Revit version has been created, uh, has been used to create those, you can click on the uh, get Revit info and pick another Revit document of any version, and it would spit out some information for you that is stored inside that file. So this file has been created in that version of Revit. Um, that's the path of the file, the document ID. Uh, if the file has any project information set in it, it actually prints those values for you. So it gives you a sort of like a quick overview of what that Revit model is, and it can figure out uh, which version of Revit you can open it with. Uh, I use it a lot when I get Revit models from other clients and customers, or I download files from the internet. I can easily figure out like what older version of Revit has been used to, um, to create this. A lot of times, like if it's a 2016 version, I know that I need to upgrade it to 17, 18, 19 that way, instead of directly bringing it to 2020, because um, that would probably break a lot of, a lot of different things. Um, uh, if you're working with families, I'll show you the, the family tools later, but there is a series of tools on their wipe. 
Um, I, I'm not going to mention all of these, but wipe model components has a lot of different uh, uh, wipers kind of functionalities that you can wipe and remove a lot of different things that you don't need in a Revit model, especially when you're sending it out. So removing all the views, removing any view that's not unsheeted or not placed on a sheet, anything that's not referenced, uh, rooms, areas, materials, all that kind of stuff. You can select as many of these as you want and you can uh, sort of like hit wipe and it would delete all those stuff off of your Revit model and you can save it as a project that you wanna send, uh, send to the outside. I'm going to open one of the, actually, let's see if I can get um, one of my casework files in here open. So I wanted to show you the match tool with the remaining time that I have. Hey, mm -hmm. um, don't worry about time. Uh, we can keep going. I think people want to. Okay. Okay. Let me know. Let me know then. When, when, stop me whenever you want to. Yeah. Um, and um, just to note, if people do have questions, they can add it to the chat. Um, uh, we'll keep going for now with the flow, but then we'll, we'll address some questions shortly towards the end of the talk. Okay. That's great. Um, let's see if I can assign a couple of default materials to this one. Okay, so I'm going to use this as an example of matching properties. I have two different types. It's the same family, but two different types of this cabinet. This one has a series of materials associated with it. I'm going to in PyRevit and say match properties. I want to match properties of an element. Click on this one. It will give me a series of the properties. I'm going to say search for material, pick all the type parameters oops, that are um, part of that type, the value of those, select and match it on this one. It'll find the corresponding parameters on the different type and match the parameter values. Now, if I had different instances of this, because I uh, sort of like picked um, type properties, I'll actually apply that to all of them. So I can say this, that, and it would apply to all of them because they're type material. So it's sort of like understand, the match tool understands the different, the instance parameter versus type parameters and the way it needs, they need to apply to the, to the different types. So that's an example of how you can use the match properties tool. Um, it's a smart enough to pick and choose. So when you click on the element, it actually doesn't know what that element is, but it looks through the element properties, what is type, what is instance, and give you a list of those, and it can match in between the different, uh, different elements. You don't have to use the match between the same types. You can actually use a different family, different type. As long as those parameter name matches, it can match the properties between them. Um, I was gonna show you, let's see if I have a, quick uh, cabinet, let's say uh, base cabinet. Let's say I have a base cabinet, five drawers. I'm going to open this. I wanna show you this cycle types tool that's super helpful when you're working with families. So if I'm designing this family and I have multiple configurations for this family built like this, I need to be able to uh, see my if my family flexes correctly across these different types. So I can use the cycle types here and it swaps the uh, sort of like the type in my family, so I can easily test and see if the uh, if the tool, if the family that I've created flexes correctly between the types. So that's super helpful. And you can see there's a box around the tab that says this is a family, not a normal normal Revit document. Um, so this is as much as I really wanted to uh, show you how the uh, sort of like part of it tools are and work. Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit more stuff about like. The, the more advanced parts, parts of PyRevit. The extension system that we talked about, you can open the extensions. In this example, there's a whole bunch of extensions that actually are, um, are shipped with PyRevit. There, there's a whole bunch of them that you can install. For example, PyApex has been created by somebody else for the PyRevit project. You can install these extensions from the internet. It installs on the location that you want in your machine and it gets loaded. Um, in this case, I'm going to load the PyRevit dev tools. That's my uh, development tools. You're going to see a whole bunch of errors and whatnot because it's the development branch. But there are two other tools that I wanted to show you. I want to uh, sort of like show you how uh, this concept of PyRevit tools or the concept of PyRevit bundles, as I call them, 
um, is super flexible. They can do multiple different things with it. Um, so once this get loaded, um, I'll show you how that works. In the meantime, I wanted to show you this, the developer page for, if you wanna get into part of a development, uh, creating different commands and whatnot, the videos, and this is where the description that you need and all the documentation that you need for the bundles are, the bundles and the extensions. And I'll quickly show you what the what real bundles are, but for all the other different, you know, specific bundle types and whatnot, you can refer to this documentation. Everything is documented in here in the best way I could. If you see any errors and uh, typos and all that kind of stuff, let me know where you wanted to um, have anything added to it. Just let me know and I'll add it there. So I loaded the other extension. You can see this is the identical window that showed up at the, uh, the first Revit to start. This is when Pirate reloads itself. Uh, it reloaded itself, it compiled all the tools again, reassigned all the uh, buttons. So you have a completely new, uh, a fresh Pirate Revit available to you right now. So if you have added buttons or removed buttons and stuff like that, all those changes will get affected in the Revit UI. That's all without closing Revit. And I got this new tab, Pirate Revit Dev, which is my development tools. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of, uh, sort of like this is the, uh, the section that I have for testing all the different bundle types. Um, all the tools that I've shown you thus far, they're all Python bundles. It's a uh, sort of like a directory with a specific extension that hosts a, a Python script. Um, if you hold Alt and click on, uh, let me actually sp sp uh, pick a simple one here. Um, let's uh, cl click on print sheets. Hold on, Alt and click on the tool. It'll open the Windows Explorer. It'll take you to that directory that that tool uh, has the script and sits inside it. And sort of like you can see that inside this extension, it says part of it tools dot extension. That's an extension bundle that has the extension in its name, and that's how Pyrid recognizes it. Part of it dot tab. It's a Revit tab bundle. Drawing set panel. See the drawing set panel and the Pyrid tab. That's the panel bundle. Print sheets push button. Print sheets push button. And inside of it, you have a script. You have an icon. There are a couple of files for uh, the user interface and a bundle YAML file that has information about that bundle. Uh, like for example, what is the tooltip? Uh, what is the actual title that you want to be in the UI? Like I don't want the print sheets to be right after each other. I need a new line between them. So it's sort of like it's smaller in size. That's where I can uh, sort of like fully configure the way uh, I want this tool to be visible in the UI. You wanna to assign tooltips, all sorts of stuff to it. That's all that information can be assigned in the bundle YAML. You can even configure the tool to be only available within certain Revit versions uh, if you're using a specific API. But that's where the script is. Now, this, as I mentioned, it's a Python bundle. There's a whole bunch of different bundles available in PyRevit. Like for example, I'm going to show you a couple of ones. This is a hyperlink bundle. All it does is that when you click on it, it opens a web page for you. So it's a great way if you want to add a couple of like shortcuts and stuff to your own company and standards and whatnot inside the Rev user interface. Very simple to set up and, and um, use. Um, this one is called a content bundle. So if I alt click on it, it'll take me to the bundle directory and you can see there's no script inside this thing. There's a whole bunch of Revit families and an icon. Um, a content bundle uh, deploys Revit families to the, your users. So if you click on this, it actually places a family in the Revit model without you, uh, without any need for you to write any code and stuff like that. Um, you can ask, actually place those inside the inside the bundle. So if I uh, shift click on this bundle, the content bundle, again, there's a black dot in front of it. If I shift click, it places a different version of that family that you want inside the Revit model. Let's see. Uh, content bundle, a different version, that's there. And all of that is actually provided inside the content bundle. You see there's a south symbol, north symbol, and I have a specific one for Revit 2020. So you can customize these families with different Revit versions. This is a great way to deploy some of these standard families uh, that you want the users to use. Like for example, the um, if you wanna markers for different points across your projects and all that kind of stuff, and they're supposed to use a very specific family, that's a good way of uh, shipping those to your users. You can access Dynamo, Grasshopper, uh, different types of programming languages, um, the, uh, let's say, um, and, um, and a whole bunch of basically different types of bundles that you can access. Um, in this example, I'm going to actually draw a piece of wall. Let's see, let's go here. Draw a piece of wall and a text. Um, 
you can see that you can set the context for your scripts as well. So you can see that the test C-sharp script is disabled right now. I can't click on it because it requires a, a text and a wall to be selected to activate that tool. And this is as easy as going inside the bundle definition. See, there's a script C-sharp and a YAML file. This is as easy as going inside the bundle definition and telling part of it that I need the standard walls and a standard text node as a context for this tool. That's all you need to do to get that feature. Uh, implementing these stuff is, in C-sharp is, 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 is a lot harder for add-ons. Uh, you can see a whole lot of these tools in Pyramid are actually disabled because they need selection. So they need some sort of a selection and they get activated. So it's, it's, it gives you a lot of tools to fine tune the way you want your users to work with these kind of stuff. One of the other nice things about having bundles is that uh, let's say you have a Dynamo script. You can uh, throw your Dynamo definition inside a bundle, ship it to your users. They can start using the tool. And once you're uh, comfortable with uh, sort of like creating that functionality in C Sharp or PyRevit in, in Python, you can actually swap the content of that bundle without making any changes to it and change the functionality without users being affected. So something it wraps, it provides this a uniform way of distributing tools to your users that don't really, it doesn't really care about what's inside. They don't really care about what's inside it. They don't need to learn how to, they need to run the Dynamo runner and stuff to get the tool. And once you change it, the workflow changes. It's the exact same workflow. You can change the underlying uh, um, script and all that kind of stuff as much as you want. Um, so that's sort of like how the part of it extensions and bundles work. Now in this example, I wanna set up a tiny, tiny extension in here just to get one simple tool um, loaded. I'm gonna grab the icon from here just because I don't wanna go and download an icon. I'm going to create a directory here on my desktop, call it, uh, let's say my company. And inside of it, I'm gonna say, give me a, uh, my extension dot extension. So I'm creating a pirate extension. Inside of it, I want a, let's say, um, let's say my, uh, I don't know, my company dot tab. So this creates a Revit tab. I'm going to inside of it because inside that tab, I want another thing that's called a panel. You can actually create multiple panels or multiple tabs if you want to. Inside the panel, I need a, Let's say let's in this call, let's call it tool. And this is going to be a push button tool. You can create different types of buttons. Some of them are stack buttons that you can select and swap and split buttons and stuff like that, that you can, um, you can create. And inside this, I'm going to drop a file. That is a script.py. And I'm going to throw that icon in here too. And that's all I need to set up an extension for PyRevit. Now I'm gonna go into Revit, go under the PyRevit settings and tell PyRevit where to load my extension from. Desktop, my company, and make sure that you've selected the parent directory of all those extensions. You can have multiple extensions listed in here as well. Select that folder and save and reload. Now PyRevit reloads itself finds that new extension and creates the necessary user interface for you to be able to use that, uh, that uh, extension. Now, um, the speed of the performance of Revit that you're seeing right now is kind of slow it's because I'm running in a VM um, on your machine with multiple CPUs and stuff uh, available to it and a lot of RAM. Uh, part of it generally loads in like less than a couple of seconds. So it's not, it's not a massive, uh, massive time consuming thing. So Pyrevit reloaded, you see there's a new tab called My Company, there's a new panel, and there's a new tool with that icon. So all I'm going to do right now is to open my script and say print save. Here, click on the tool, you'll see the output right there. Without changing Revit, you want to change that? change it as much as you want, click on it again, you'll get a new version of the tool. Um, so you can create a script that sort of, you can change, you can keep playing with it and work with your project all the time. 
um, working with setting up tools for your um, uh, for Revit this way is super, super easy. And I showed you a lot of different files that could be placed inside the bundles. These two, actually you don't even have to provide the icon. So it's really the script that's kind of like necessary to be there. But with minimum directory structure and sort of like files, you can actually set up a, a good set of tools. And if you want to add more tools, just add, keep adding more push buttons and different ones. If you want to combine them in um, sort of like different groups like these, like this one, I'm going to alt click inside that tool and show you how the directory structure is. See, there's a series of push buttons inside another bundle it's called a split push button. And all of these different bundle types is documented inside that documentation that I've told you about. Everything about the bundle metadata, the context that activates the selection and deactivates those, the laying out the bundles, uh, laying out the tools like you want them to be sorted in a specific way or placed in a specific uh, place in the user interface. And uh, maybe you want to ship like binaries, libraries, and all kind of, uh, all that kind of stuff with your tool. You can do that. Um, now, for the for sort of like the last part of this conversation, I want to show you. Uh, I want to tell you about a couple of different things that Pyrobit does. Um, 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 the, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. A quick note. We'll we'll give it about five minutes, and then we'll um, open to questions and stuff. Okay. Let me set yeah. my timer for five minutes. Five minutes. I'll close. Um, there are a couple of different tools that are available in Pyrovit that are super powerful. All of these are documented again. Um, if you don't know where to find them, reach out to me. I'll show you where they are. But the, I, wanted, I want you to know, um, especially if you're developing tools for your company and you want to distribute these tools to a company, uh, knowing that these functionality exist in Pyrovit uh, will give you a lot of, uh, a lot of freedom. Uh, number one is the telemetry API. Pyrovit can collect uh, command execution, script execution, and all that kind of stuff for your company. You can set up a, uh, inside the, uh, the documentation, there's a telemetry system document that uh, documents exactly how this telemetry system works. It's, it ships with every version of the Pyramid. You don't have to do anything. You can just pick a server, set it up, uh, create your own database. If you don't have one, you kind of have to have a database to store all this information, um, provide the access and uh, credentials and all that, uh, all that kind of stuff to that database, to the telemetry server. And the telemetry server starts listening to uh, the calls from PyRevit. This way you can, if you're developing tools for your company, you can actually collect all these feedback of how your tool's being used, uh, which tools is generating errors and all that kind of stuff um, from, from PyRevit. Um, one of the other things uh, that PyRevit does, the telemetry system does, what I talked about is called the script telemetry. That's information about the PyRevit scripts. It also can send you application telemetry. So opening a document, closing a document, syncing a document, changing views, printing, all that kind of stuff. All this information plus the information that's available through those events could be sent to your telemetry system. You can set up a really good system this way that tracks. Um, it's, not, it's not designed to track the users. It's, it's designed to capture bugs and behaviors in the way that Revit is being used across your organization. So you can uh, sort of like foster better behavior in terms of like using Revit and then catch your errors uh, or the most popular tools that you have so you can implement, um, you can work on those and improve them and all that kind of stuff. Um, Pyrovit also ships with a, a command line utility. It's called the Pyrovit CLI. After installation of Pyrovit, you can run this. It has a lot of different functions. You can deploy extensions. Uh, you can basically use this Pyrovit CLI to deploy Pyrovit in the exact manner and fashion that you want on your, um, on your, uh, on your target systems. Um, uh, you can deploy your own custom extensions. Basically, anything that you want to is possible through, the, uh, through this Pyrovit. Uh, one of the very simple options available on that machine. So even if as a good utility, even if I have it on your some of those machines, you can run it and it tells you exactly what Revit versions are assigned to it. This is something that I keep updated all the time based on the new releases. Pyrovit intimately knows exact Revit versions, built numbers and all that kind of stuff that's documented there. If you want to access that file, I'll actually show you where that file is on the repo, but it gives you a lot of information about the user machine, the installed Revit versions, the kind of extensions, what Revit, what Pyrovit clones that you have, and which versions of Revit this Pyrovit is attached to. Um, so that's the Pyrovit CLI. The documentation for it is placed here inside the Pyrovit CLI. All of that stuff is documented right here. And the last part that I wanna show you, it's sort of like in development, it's called the Pyrovit Roots API, the Pyrovit HTTP API. Um, you can activate this Roots API and design a script, a Python script that defines web API uh, uh, sort of like a cert, uh, REST API functionality. And I'll show you an example of it here. 
for any of you that's familiar with Python um, Flask library and sort of like this style of um, um, decorating functions in uh, Python with the um, HTTP paths, you can define something like this in PyRibbit, API root path doors, and then assign a function to it that gets the doors using the Revit API and sort of like create that inside the PyRevit. So when Revit launches, you can actually control Revit or graph data or make changes to Revit using an HTTP API. Um, that effectively kind of put Revit in, puts Revit in the cloud. Uh, it doesn't provide a base uh, API because every company wants to work with different these. So you kind of have to create your own app. You have to create your own API based on whatever you want to do with the paths and whatnot and, and uh, sort of like authorization and anything that you need to do within that API to make it work across with your company. But that gives you the ability to open Revit and have a web server running in the background that has access to Revit memory and Revit API. Um, that's the part of it roots API, what I call it. So if you go under settings, this is where you can activate it. And uh, it has a, a, a couple of different sort of like base core functionality that can tell you how many instances of Revit are running and what the, uh, the port number all, uh, are for those uh, Revit. So you can sort of like, you know, uh, grab those information and talk to those Revit's directly. Um, everything about this feature is documented here. Uh, you can easily get that set up, get it tested. Let me know if you have any comments about it. And that's pretty much everything that I have. Five minutes. Okay, brilliant. <laughs> um, so we can take questions. I know um, Andre had one earlier, but thanks a lot for the, the, the run through of that. I'm, I'm blown away by the amount of structure and thought that's gone into the tool. It's really phenomenal. It's almost like another program in itself like another rabbit <laughs> it's phenomenal um but it's really insightful um thank you we'll take some questions what was the other one i'm just looking at andre's question earlier about a wall oh yeah you you're talking about um <clears throat> an element uh, is, is we value I take it revalue is hitting a wall when an element is within a group. Is, um, um, so for anything, first question. obviously I love to, so a general comment, obviously there's a, um, I've, I've always developed these tools as a side uh, project to my actual job that I had. Um, now I work for McNeil, so this is my first software development job kind of, but still that's my main job and part of it is something that I develop on the side. Um, so a lot of these tools might not have the full range of functionality that you kind of accept, expect, expect from, um, from them. Um, one of the best things that you can do is that if you go to the repo and you go to the issues, you can actually report anything that you want uh, and all the bugs and errors and stuff that you see in here. So we get to it on a priority sort of like- Yeah, I can, um, I can attest for that actually. That's how you and I got chatting originally. I think I had an issue yeah. on installation. Um, and yeah, you're you're on there, <laughs> and it, yeah, no, my 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 point was was a little different. Um, I'm I'm kind of not expecting Revit to let you do that, right? Any any element that is in a group can only be edited when it is in the group editor. So if you so, want to come with an outside thing and you want to change the name of a family and that family is inside a group. Revit by default will just say, sorry, it's in a group. Yeah. Cannot touch. What is what what will then be the Pi Revit? Will Pi Revit uh, break the group or just report the error and say do No, work? so as far as as far as I know, like I've played with this a lot uh, in last year and a couple of years back. I don't know if there have been any changes to the Revit API. I don't think it has been because I read those uh, uh, stuff on every version. But Revit API doesn't low opening groups at this point because it puts Revit in a different edit context. There's only one exception is that if there's only one instance of that group in your model, you can actually make that change and Revit will pass because there's only one instance of that Revit. That the Revit okay, group. yeah, that's what I expected. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, well, <clears throat> yeah, it looks like we don't have questions or we don't have a question um but yeah that was um that was really insightful really brilliant um 
just curious actually whilst we've got um we can just uh hang for now um i'm actually i'm going to stop the recording uh, and then we can continue just the conversation so yeah sure um, thanks everyone please join uh stick around we'd like uh, we can talk and have the equivalent of our virtual beers that we would have had having met physically um but uh, see you all in october all right Good night.